Hello and welcome. I'm Scott. I'm Mike. And we're here to talk about our Arizona State University Information Technology Capstone Project, the Sense Rover. Now, we've all heard of the Roomba, and when you look at the Roomba, you know, for a long time when the Roomba was out, you know, they weren't very intelligent devices. You know, it was just really a random process. Some of the newer projects that are out there, you know, Dyson has released one, Neato has one, and Roomba has Amira and some new products. And those IoT devices are a lot more intelligent. They actually include lasers for some basic positioning, and they're capable of a lot more. And what we're looking to do is really take that robotic Internet of Things platform and bring it into a next level with the Sense Rover. Uh, there's a lot of competition in the home uh, vacuum area, but one of the things that you have when you're taking care of your house is you've got the inside and you have the outside. And I don't even know if we mentioned what is the sense rover even doing? Like we're not we're not picking up absolutely. crumbs off the floor. This is outside. Absolutely, absolutely, exactly, Mike. It's it's designed to go out in the yard. You'll have a small little docking station. It will just park itself, and then on the right time, it'll run out of its docking mm -hmm. station, go out to the yard and start treating your weeds. Now the first version that we're working on is designed uh, with you know the technology and the landscaping that we know, which is Arizona. You know, desert landscaping. Myself, my house is all desert landscaping. And our HOA requires that we regularly weed our yard. If we have weeds sitting out, even one or two that we miss, I get a bill from them. Mm. And honestly, I would much rather spend my time doing something else than walking around the yard trying to find that one weed the HOA might find. I weed. I weed a lot. I do. And I, I, we don't have an HOA, but even, even when you live in a city, the city will drive by. The way They will mm -hmm. give you a ticket if you have a certain amount of neglect on your property. So it's something, especially down here with so many people with rock landscapes, um, where it's so easy to see where the weed pops up. Not a yard, where sometimes it's mixed in with the grass, but when you have a, a nice, usually kind of light brown tan landscape, a green weed that pops up is... It's easy to spot. Looking at our competitors, looking at the Roomba, looking at those, those are all for the inside. Sense Rover's taking that same kind of technology and bringing it to the outside, but not the original simple basic systems that randomly go around. Once you go outside, you've got a lot of new things that come in. All of a sudden, when you're looking at, you know, how does, you know, how does a Rover function when you're outside, inside, you've got a room. Rooms have walls, and uh, you don't have to worry about your Roomba driving over mm. into the neighbors. Or out into the street and getting run over. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, if you look at the cost of a Roomba, uh, a really good Roomba starts at about $1,000 these days. I was days. looking, I actually, it's funny, I was looking on, on um, Amazon and just Googled Roomba, and I was I was a little shocked. I actually hadn't even thought about it, but I was seeing eight ninety nine, you know, yeah. nine ninety nine. You could get some kind of off-brand cheaper versions, but it looked like to get a decent robotic vacuum cleaner these days this is around a thousand dollars yeah absolutely the market is there these products are, have actually been quite successful Roomba has really revolutionized their company and it's at a price point that's in the one to two thousand dollar range and that's a mass produced price point so what we're actually talking about is a real industrial design level component that has multiple microprocessors multiple sensors um, it's really kind of funny when you look at it. We will have more processing power on board, on board, not just including what we're going to have in the cloud, but on board in the Sense Rover than IBM's Deep Blue supercomputer that uh, was the first supercomputer to beat humans at chess. I mean, that set a new computing wow. standard. Um, you know, we're literally talking about millions of times more processing power than what they needed to send a man to the moon. So it's pretty exciting yeah. when you look at that. Um, Absolutely. So overall, um, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the sub-projects and really what is going to make up the Sense Rover project? Sure. So we will have um, three sub-project areas, um, the first being the, the Sense Rover, the, the Rover platform itself, mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, okay. Scott's, Scott's domain. Um, we also have the server system, which is the part of the project that I'm uh, diving into headfirst uh, with our our lamp stack, we have our Azure uh, cloud server instance. And yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, that's a big word to say it's cloud server. Um, and you know, we're talking about actual infrastructure as a service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at that, uh, we're not we're not doing shared hosting. Um, you know, uh, 
talk a little bit about what does what does that mean? I mean, do when you want a cloud server, and is it something you go to Microsoft, we just click a button, and all of a sudden every package that we need is there, or what does that really involve, Mike? Well, well, no. First, I mean, you 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 deal with them to provision the server, and they basically. They provision it. They hand it over to you. Um, there's really nothing. You you do get to choose uh, your your operating your operating system. Mm, okay. And we we are running uh, CentOS. Ah, uh, Community Enterprise Linux. So. That's right. Uh, Seven point two, and from there, uh, you you basically you create a root login and. <laughs> That's pretty much where you're at, right? They just, yeah. here, here's the keys, it's empty, up to you. Exactly, empty platform. And you know, obviously I was leading the witness here, but <laughs> there's a good, good reason for it because in the end, uh, when you start looking at basic information technology, uh, getting an empty Linux box, uh, there is a lot of potential, but there's nothing there. We're not dealing with shared hosting where you know the web server is configured and you have cPanel or a consumer-oriented tools. Uh, what we're really talking about is we have military-grade encryption where we have that login and 100% of the server is going to be our setup. Absolutely. For me, one of the things that's helped me the most is creating um, a virtual instance of of, of our server on my own machine at home and being able to play around and do a lot of testing there and that that's been invaluable for me so the first thing is our, our web server which is a Apache 2.4.6 I believe um, that we have installed we'll be installing a, a MySQL database we'll be installing and already have uh, started to install and configure PHP as our server-side scripting language we have uh, some of our security features that will be um, Snort as our um, intection, uh, sorry, intrusion, intrusion detection and prevention system. We're going to go with Snort. O overall, really, I think what we're saying is it's it's, it's a pretty impressive server system. Uh, you know, having worked in industry myself for quite a few years, uh, my expectation is by the conclusion of the Sense Rover project, we're going to have a fully documented enterprise level server that is cluster capable and fully scalable. And it's gonna be all configured and running in an infrastructure as a service node in Microsoft Azure. You know, it's really relevant technology today. And that's something that, you know, excites me a lot when we're talking about it. And that's part of the, the challenges that we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, especially from my perspective, is the, the security and, and the, what you have to do on to have this enterprise, you know, quality level system, and, and what you have to do to make sure it's secured when you're doing it on your own. You're not leaving it up to the hosting service or mm -hmm. whoever to, to make that um, to harden against security threats for you. You have to figure out um, how to do that and you know where they're coming from. So yeah. the the other third uh, sub project level was the was the web app itself, oh, yeah, absolutely. which is a huge part. And Scott, can you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So. When we're talking about the rover, you know, uh, we mentioned the idea of you're going to go outside and a Roomba doesn't drive to your neighbors. Roomba doesn't get run over in the streets, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, but the Sense <laughs> rover can. And so one of the big pieces is users are going to need to have a portal. And that portal uh, is going to need a whole bunch of things that the user can set in order to be able to control. So I'll start with technology and then we'll, we'll talk about what the user's going to do there. Yeah, but sure, that'd be great. High level, high level technology. Uh, we're going to be building the web app on the Symphony 3 platform. Uh, I chose the Symphony 3 platform for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's gotten a lot of traction in industry. Um, the second reason is, and is actually, it's one of those, I've built literally hundreds of enterprise level web apps in my career. Uh, Symphony is a new platform and I haven't used it. Um, one of the challenges that I saw and that I have at work is being a developer, it's incredibly difficult to stay current. One of the reasons I chose to come back to ASU, even though I have a successful business, is I want to make sure that my knowledge is always up to date. And honestly, I want to not just make sure my knowledge is up to date based on the knowledge that I go out into the internet and find, because that not is going to be knowledge that I searched for, which means it's biased. I chose what to search and I, I'm going to kind of have my own opinion of what's new in industry. Instead, what I wanted to do when I came back for a degree is, you know, see what, what are they teaching? What are the people who I'm actually going to be working with doing when it comes to their platforms and their technologies? What's actually being taught? And so as we've gone through, you know, I've definitely taken a look, look, of that, a look at the classes and 
this is a direction that's a little different than some of the larger Java-based and other enterprise systems that I've built. And so um, I chose Symphony 3 given the popularity and the fact, like I said, I don't have that much experience in it. So that's something we'll talk again more in challenges. But uh, because I do have enough experience, I felt pretty good about tackling you know, a platform that big, but it's definitely going to be a learning curve. So we've talked a lot about this underlying PHP and underlying Symphony platform, but we didn't talk about what a user is going to do when sure. they get there. So Mike, do you want to talk a little bit sure. about that? Sure. So um, I'm a user. I bought my, my Sense Rover, and so first step for me is I, I go online to our website and I register, um, I register my Sense Rover and register as a user. And so that will give me access to our online uh, control system web interface that we're mm -hmm. starting to discuss here. And one of the first things that a user is going to do is they're going to use um, an embedded map system that we have to draw a virtual fence of their yard or the area that they want the sense rover to go out and rove in and, and take care of the weeds for them. They'll be able to fill the rover with the gardening spray of their choice, whether they want you know manufactured Roundup or possibly they want to use a home remedy that you see sometimes that's a mix of you know, vinegar and, and salt and dish soap that's more environmentally friendly, mm. whatever they want. Uh, the user will program a weekly schedule. Um, they'll be able to have full control of when and, and, and how often the rover is going out into the yard. Uh, the rover will intelligently navigate the yard. Uh, not just random like like a Roomba. Can you talk more about that navigation, Scott? Yeah, a absolutely. So, you know, we've mentioned that it needs to be smart. If you think about weeding a yard, um, I would love to say that we have computer vision technology that is hmm. artificially intelligent and is so incredible weed. it'll never, yes, weed and it'll get it every single time. But we have to be realistic about where the technology is. Even if we look at you know, the giants out there, even if we look at what Apple's doing and what Microsoft's doing and what, you know, the top industry researchers with Google are doing, uh, the systems aren't that good yet. We don't have 100%, um, you know, computer vision to be able to, to, to get there. So what we're talking about with navigation is um, the same thing. So we have computer vision, then we have GPS. And uh, I would love it if GPS worked the way that I think most consumers think it does, which is I'm standing here. Let's go ahead and have the GPS tell me that I'm here down to the you know uh, down to the the micron, and then if I move over here or I move over here, have the GPS recognize that I've moved accurately. We all know from a technical standpoint if we've worked with GPS and actually worked with the signals, it's not nearly that accurate. So what we have is kind of three parts that we, we have when, to deal with that resolution loss. Um, the first one is, is we're taking the area that Mike talked about where we're gonna define the yard, and we're going to grid it into about three foot by three foot regions. And then what we'll do is the rover itself will actually be able to transition between grids. So if we think of a little car, I brought a model with me. If we think of a car, if a car is driving and it needs to turn, it's got wheels that turn and it has a radius. So it's impossible with software to actually drive in an absolutely perfect grid when you're dealing with wheels that go like this. So that was one of the first challenges that we get when we're talking about navigation and we're talking about GPS is to say, okay, we needed to devise to develop a mechanical platform that could turn like this. It could literally rotate among the base so that we can do a grid. And that's exactly what the sense rover is going to do is take that process and be able to walk into that gridded yard from where the user goes through. And then every single grid spot, it will take a picture. That's right. And that picture is going to be uploaded to the server. So we've got a lot of power on the rover. The rover is going to be able to use GPS, which is accurate enough to know what grid spot we're in. That's right. And then it's gonna have it has local sensors. It's got laser range finders, it has you know advanced local positioning systems, and it'll take that system and then be able to photograph it, send it up to the server, and then it'll go through cloud processing. Uh, do you want to talk sure. about well, the next step? So that that's the navigation, it's collecting these these uh, images and these coordinates from these these blocks of the yard that we've that we've basically chopped up their virtual fenced yard into. And What's going to happen then are these these photos are going to be sorted with an algorithm. 
This is a, an optic algorithm? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. Can you talk more and, about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where we get into some of the more advanced programming, which is a little bit of C, C++. And what's going to happen at that point is the rover will process those images into zones, and it's going to be looking for known patterns because, again, weeds don't grow overnight. And remember that grid? We're going to be photographing that over time. So what the rover is looking for is for a shift of an area towards the green color. And so it's going to be able to return to that area using its local sensors, make sure that it's positioned right for that picture. And then it's going to look at those pictures over time. And if a picture started tan, and then over the course of a week, it got 10% more green, well, there's a chance there's a weed developing and it'll get a little score. If it got 50% more green, well, it's almost certain. And if it got 70% more green, well, and now we've got a you know, virtual outbreak. And, and that's, that's exactly how the system's going to work. And then once it gets to that point where it's got, wow, so the, the software's saying this is most likely weed, then it's going to pitch it basically to the user and it's going to present the user with with um, almost like a prioritized list of these, these areas of the yard so the user really has final say on, okay, that's a weed, go get it. And while you, know, you don't want to put too much on the user, I think that the interface is going to be so friendly that they can open it up and flip through, click, 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 and hopefully be able to get that portion done. But there, mm -hmm. there kind of has to be that user sign-off, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the end, we're, our algorithm is going to put the areas that we think is most likely a weed um, but if little Johnny left his green toy, huh. uh, the rover's going to think that that green toy is a weed. So this is where we have a little bit of user interaction. But again, weeds don't grow overnight. So the user doesn't need to log into this regularly. They're going to be able to grab their smartphone or their tablet on the couch, and they're going to be able to look at a week worth of components. It's going to have already picked the images that it thinks have a weed. And in a single click, they're going to see a grid of images, and they're going to just be able to click yes, 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 no, yes, no, no, yes, no, no, yes, and they're going to be done. So just a couple seconds on a tablet, a couple taps, boom, they're ready, and now the rover is going to take it from there. That's right. So then, you know, you go on, you, you say, okay, I've got this. That looks like a weed. Let's take care of that area. It's growing, okay, and then sign it off. So then next time, rover goes out, rover uses uh, the GPS coordinates that it logged, you know, into the database and associated with that particular image and it will go out to that area and treat that block of yarn. At this point, I'm hoping that everybody who's watching this video has probably read our report because there's a lot more information and details sure. Sure. in the report there. But when we go through that Agile component, one of the big parts of Agile, what does Agile give you in the real world? And one of the real world components is it gives you flexibility. You know, it embraces change, but even more so, even more important is it gives you communication. And that's something that our team has really worked hard to make sure from the beginning we have communication set up. I mean, obviously, you know, you're not going to be an information technology student and not have access to email um, and, you know, basic components. But we've gone a lot further than that. Uh, you know, we have weekly video calls already. And yeah. we have, you know, honestly, uh, almost daily communications in real time via Slack. And the great part about what Slack is, is it's a little bit like Skype, but it's designed with uh, channel history and searching in mind. So when we talk about topics, we can have channels that are oriented towards those different components that we're working on. And that's something that as we get into even faster paced development through the later sprints, we're not going to be struggling to figure out how do we communicate with each other. We already have, um, you know, eight, ten weeks of experience in using this platform, talking to each other, finding out how things work, and bridging that gap that you're going to have when you have, uh, unlike a work environment where everybody might be on site, you know, we're dealing with people who are working on different schedules and, you know, in this real world have day jobs. And we're also dealing with uh, people who have different. Uh, skill sets and I would say uh, much different levels of experience. So Scott's in a league of his own, but I'm really happy to be on the same team and, and working together. So should we go on to progress? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing that we've worked on mm -hmm. is the mechanical design. And that's the rover itself has a lot of 3D printed components. And that's one that we're scheduled to be 100% complete before the end of IFT 401 with a viable working mechanical design platform. Uh, and we've gotten that far enough right now that we have our first, I'll call it one and a half prototypes built of the hardware.
We have a lot of moving pieces in this project. We're talking about mechanical design of the rover. We're talking about electronic design of the rover. We're not just bolting a system in and going. We're actually building the circuit boards, designing the circuit boards. Uh, the microprocessors themselves are commodity items. We'll be using like Intel Edison chips and things like that. But so many of the interconnects, so many of the networks, all the firmware. So we've gotten a good jump start on that. And let's take a second and see it in action. This is an early prototype with only a few systems functional. You can see the rover rotate in place, moving between grid areas. The rover will use a magnetometer for absolute heading, you know, north, south, east, west, to augment its GPS location. When it's near the target grid, the articulated spray head will allow coverage of the entire grid area. And then to avoid obstacles, the rover will use its laser and sonar sensors to follow the right-hand rule, returning to its original path as soon as it can. It'll perform these actions fully autonomously, so it only needs Wi-Fi at the docking station, which is an important feature since home Wi-Fi routers are not likely to reach the entire yard. When the rover's docked, it will take the time to upload the new photos it took, information about the areas it sprayed, as well as download a new list of targets and update its schedule. So now that we've seen the demo, uh, Scott, can you talk a little bit more about the rover software? Yeah, absolutely. So the big focus that we're going to push to in 402 is actually making that fully autonomous and making that completely run. So uh, we haven't done a whole lot of work on that yet. What I've done so far is actually established the uh, version control repositories. So we're using Atlassian Bitbucket. We've got report. Uh, we've got logins, and we've got a team created. So we actually now have all the repositories. We make. I have set up all the cross compiles. And I've got just a little bit more than a hello world when it comes down to the actual <laughs> components, plus the firmware that drives the optical encoders in the wheel. Actually, it was required to get that done in order to make that demo, since we're just dealing with PWM from the RC controller. So I wrote a small little RC PWM interpreter to run our wheel encoders um, to get to that demo side. But then we'll have a lot of work ahead of us next semester mm -hmm. on the Rover software. So uh, progress on the the web or sorry the main server our production server. Well, the, one of the first things that we did uh, was to and again uh, me using VirtualBox and, and really playing around with my instance at home is is installing and reinstalling uh, Apache and and configuring that. So we did not use we're not using the default directory structure for our document root for any right. of that. We're 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 having a custom directory structure under a sense rover directory where we have um, everything set up. And a part of the setup for our system also was making sure that we had some default uh, default sense rover user groups so that our, yes. our teamwork is shared and, and has uh, group ownership. Uh, Absolutely. Every and member then, of the team. What, then, what I really got to learn about in this web server setup was how to, to set up a virtual host, right? Yes. And, and, and setting up and configuring a virtual host, which we will probably have two by the end. We'll have mm -hmm. our website and then we'll have our API calls that are yes. coming to the same IP address, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and setting that up so that you don't actually go in and mess with the configuration file, the actual mm -hmm. HTTPD configuration file, but um, going in and making your own configuration file within our sense rover directory structure, having a symlink that points to that, that the that Apache goes to that conf D direct for, directory in Etsy, HTTPD conf D, yes. goes in, sweeps in, goes to ours, which I, I really enjoy learning about that setup. And, Part of um, well, part of the pro one of the problems that we had originally when we were starting up uh, the web server the the web server was um, we, w we weren't able to start it up yeah because we moved all these directories around absolutely and why that's where SA our, Linux, SA Linux uh, yeah. uh, right now we're past them at an acceptable well, level so, for where we need to be today so well first we just we figured out you know set set enforcing to zero which is you know command line command you can do to to end the to to set him, to set SE Linux to permissive mode, but that is temporary. And every time you reboot the server, you got to do that again if you're, you're going to run into the same problem. So we were able to go to um, a uh, SE Linux configuration file and permanently set the mode to permissive. But that means that we don't get the added yeah. security benefit of having it turned on. So it's not totally off. Permissive means that you're still getting the warnings, but you're not getting the enforcement. So one of the long-term goals for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, as the as the you know security and the systems administrators, to figure out how to keep SE Linux enforcing and have all yeah. of our uh, components operational. 
Absolutely. So that's you know that'll be saved for 402 to actually build those security. Um, in order to access that, we've already set up our packet-based firewall that's running also in the Azure cloud, and that's sitting in front of our that's uh, right. our virtual machine. And right now we have just three ports enabled through it, just uh, S um, SSL, HTTPS, HTTP, so 44380, as well as port 22 for our SSH administrative connection. Because you can go in uh, and type in www.senserover and get our homepage and get our web app already, um, it's really important that we had a firewall configuration. We got started and at least had some level of SE Linux and Apache running. So I feel really good about where we're at. So would this be a good time to just quickly talk about the security that we do have Absolutely. in place? Um, so right away, once once we provisioned the server and it had a, a public IP address, um, you could literally go check a log, see how many thousand failed attempts, Yes. have a sip of coffee, check the log again, and yeah. it will have increased. Yeah, it's... Attempts uh, at root. Yeah, the, the, the number, you know, as we've turned on logging on the server and we've actually looked, the requests per second of intrusion attempts is, you know, through the roof. It's literally it? measured... We Didn't you yeah. say it was, we averaged it out to like two hack yeah, attempts two, per second? Two, two intrusion huh. attacks per second is what we're currently... Uh, um, mm -hmm. Running through. So uh, obviously, you know, we are in Azure Cloud. We're in a very public IP block. Uh, we're in a known public server IP block. So, and it's on incredibly great fast hardware with SSDs. So we're a high value target. There's, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of reason to take over our site. And it shows. So this is one um, we'll have to be extremely diligent, uh, you know, throughout even, even the time between semesters to make sure our services aren't taken over and run away with. Well, this was all brand new for me. So the for at least the, the minimum that we could do, at least for now, is uh, what we have done is we have exchanged our our public-private key pairs with our server um, so that we have encrypted encrypted key uh, uh, login. Mm -hmm. And and we got that set up. And then beyond that, we went and actually configured the SSH daemon so that we turned off uh, password. This has been recent, too. Turned off password authentication. We turned off um, remote uh, root login, yeah, and um, that basically should mean that the only two people that can get in there, yep, are me and you. Exactly, with our SSH keys, with our with server. our key. You know, if you don't have our key, I don't see how you can get in there at this point. But yeah. we're still, I'm still learning, and that's that's a good first step. Yeah. So. Uh, we could talk about what challenges coming up or yeah, any? I, I think that's a good way to close on this you know sure. you've heard a lot about the sensor over project you've heard a lot about what we've done uh honestly when you're hmm. even hearing that description about the project uh you know that was the first major step is coming up with that and that leads to really the challenges uh there's a lot here it's actually hard in 30 minutes to really get through all of the details which is why like I said, definitely read the report but there's a lot here and so that brings some of the first challenges. First one is mechanical design. This isn't just a simple website project. Uh, you know, we could have anything as simple as, hey, this wheel motor is binding, or this optical sensor is physically obstructed by the chassis design. So we deal with mechanical engineering problems. You know, obviously to, to work through those challenges, we're running electrical simulations, we're running actual you know, CAD simulations of that, but those only go so far. Uh, other challenges mechanically, we're 3D printing this, and uh, I'm personally 3D printing it myself. I've got a 3D systems uh, component, and I also am lucky enough to have uh, a laser cutter so that I can cut my own Lexan sheets and a few other mechanical tools, but I don't have a CNC machine, so those I ha we have to go out for. Um, so, and it can get expensive quick, and there is a price limit in real world maximum uh, that we want to spend on the project. So those bring some really interesting challenges and ones that I don't think we're going to see in other ones. And with the mechanical is the exact same thing, like I mentioned earlier, we're building our own circuit boards. This isn't just, hey, I tossed in a basic system. We've got our microprocessors are commodity, but all the rest of the sensors uh, are a combination of uh, connections where everything is custom. And that really leads to some of the next challenges is all of these systems are all built with a lot of complex software yeah. that has to talk to, you know, has to talk to the cloud and talk to the server, um, and <clears throat> there's there's a lot there. So that's well, part of part of the next steps for me. Um, we are going to uh, incorporate Let's Encrypt, which is uh, mm -hmm. an open source uh, free um, SSL certificate authority that yes. will allow us to um, 
have end-to-end -end encrypted internet connection with all these yeah, connected so, devices. That's a really big, big part of this. Absolutely. So definitely a challenge uh, is the fact that we're going to have personal information. We're going to have oh, mother, yes. we're going to have photographs of within somebody's yard attached with latitude and longitude. Mm. Um, that's not information I personally would want out. So we're going to need full level symmetric encryption to be able to encrypt that bundle and send, but that's not going to be enough. We're going to need public private key encryption to be able to talk across an SSL with key exchange. So there's a lot of encryption steps involved and a lot of those kind of components bring a ton of challenges because it's not as simple as receive this piece of input and store this piece of input. We're going to have a tremendous amount of moving pieces and a tremendous amount that's going to fall. And as Mike, you're building out the database, that's something that we have to deal with when we're looking at field banks. And it's something that goes mm. beyond some of the experience that you've had Absolutely. in databases. Mm. That was the other challenge for me. And then that's, that's I think, it for, for my side right now is, is, is also building out the database and, and, and creating the data, the data model itself, which, um, which is definitely the next big step. I would say November, December, um, my focus is going to be on continuing to learn more about security and then getting the database set up and building the data model. Uh, I hope you're as excited by this hmm. project as we are. Um, I think we're going to have a really incredible product at the end. Yeah, well, thank you, Scott. I'm Absolutely. Mike. Nice, nice to uh, present to you guys today and hope you enjoyed it.